pressure of to 40. If you sort of lie face down, obviously the body then readjusts quickly. And if you don't have glaucoma, it comes down to 12 again. But if you have low outflow facility, it will take much longer for the pressure to come down. So possibly for up to an hour, you're running a pressure of 40, which nobody, not even you, is aware of because you're sleeping on your face. And even if you sleep side down, when you look at patients with glaucoma, when the glaucoma is asymmetrical, when you ask them which side they tend to sleep on, they tend to sleep on the side with the worst field. Because when you sleep, like it or not, you're pressing on your eyeball a little bit. So, we then need to match our treatment to the person. So that includes having that conversation, believe it or not. So you come into my clinic and you think, what's she on about? She's asking how the patient is sleeping. Oh my God, what's going on? That's why. Okay? And then we need to look at the open or closed, young or old, and what are the risk factors which we've described there. And then we then look at the age. But it's not absolute age. It's more about life expectancy. What's their life expectancy? You know, in these parts of the world, people are more open now about talking about what their life expectancy is. So, what you want to do is have good sight out, leave them. So if they've got 40 years ahead of them, you've got to be aggressive. If they've got five years and full field, you can leave them alone. So, this is how we make the decision about target pressure. Once we've taken all that into consideration, we then come back to our tests. If there's existing damage, if there's reduced... Is everybody aware of the um, importance of central corneal thickness now? So you have to adjust the pressure. And that's only come around in the last 10 years, you know? So we've got to... And then the age, family history, and of course ethnicity. This was sent to me by one of the contractor who was working with us and helping us with, with one of our digital um, um, stuff about three, four years ago. He said, um, my mom's been treated for glaucoma, she's quite frail, um, and he lived up in Leicester, with his, his mom was up in Leicester, and, and, and didn't want to bring her down. I said, just send a picture. And then as soon as he sent those pictures, I just said, what drops is she having? Preserved drops, you know? glaucoma clinic, three hour wait, everybody is happy that the pressure is 11, but the patient is not happy. And when the patient is not happy, the patient will not use their drops. And just like when we have piano lessons on Monday, we practice on Sunday. So when the next clinic appointment is in the week's time, they start to use their drops. So you see the pressure of 11, you think they're well controlled. But they can't leave this way. So the compromise, they will say, I'll use it one in three days. And then because they intend to use it one in three days, they will end up using it one in five days. So this really matters. And where you matter, where you really matter, is that they tell you they don't tell us. They moan to you, they don't moan to us. So it really matters that you give us that feedback. Because they're so compliant when they come. I mean, I've been a junior doctor. They moan, they tell you you've done everything wrong. And then they go and sit with a consultant and they tell you everything is perfect. And I, what? And I've forgotten all that till one or two of my juniors recently pointed that out with me. When they came to present a patient and they were behind me saying, as possible to use preservative free drops but unfortunately at the end of the line alfrimonidine and rinzolamide are still not preservative free available and one of the things that we tend to do in glaucoma care now is early selective laser trabeculoplasty so for most of my patients at my eye clinic i offer them slt quite early on in their disease because that helps them that works in 65 percent of patients and it helps them to be drops free and you can repeat every two years and keep them off drops and keep those red eyes away for, some, for as long as possible and I'll do that for any age no matter how frail you are I will help you hold your head to the split lamp for 10-15 minutes and then that's it for another two years and I also help 
clients by giving them a piece of paper with all the drops they've got. I encourage them to stick it on their fridge. And again, I'll send that to you because if they're blocking the drops, you can say, have you, how do you remember your drops? You know? Or for the younger ones, have not said that. Everybody, including my 86-year-old mom now, have, they have their iPad and their iPhone. They can have simple reminders, or they can just use the alarm on their phones to remind them. So, the principle of treatment, we've talked about normal tension, glaucoma, and blood pressure, and we try to do neuroprotection. Because drops may not bring the pressures low enough in normal tension, glaucoma, I tend to propose surgery quite early before they have significant field loss. Um, and I've talked about the blood pressure, and then we do every type of surgery. We've got three different consultants at the clinic, at my eye clinic, who have different glaucoma interests. So I do Zen, one of my colleagues does the eye stent, I do um, so I do Zen implant, I do the non-penetrating surgery, I do bar belts and, and trabeculectomy. So that's a patient with a tube in the eye, that's a patient who's had a trap, and all the things that we do um, include viscocanalostomy and canaloplasty. In those patients who would rather not have a blab, who are young and who are early in their, their condition. And so that's one thing that Sam Silo gave me that yesterday, she does the eye stents and we do viscocanulostomy. That's been around for about 15 years, but it still hasn't caught up because you need to be highly skilled to do it. But the advantage of it we'll talk about later. And I think I've got a video that shows how I do it. So basically we give a little bit of a local anesthetic. Just move that forward a little bit. Tight. 
the suture tight and that proves, that opens up the canal of Schlem, basically. So we bring the eye back a good 15, 20 years by doing that. And the fantastic thing about that is, is that fills down the line, we can still do a trabeculectomy, we can still do tubes. So basically that eye stays comfortable for a lot longer during that patient's um, active life. And then we just close it a bit as usual. So there are no leaks, no bleb, no bleb discomfort, no risk of flat ACs, and there is less frequent visit. When I do a trabeculectomy, I see them at day one, day three, day seven, week one, week two. When I do that, I leave them week one, week three, and we're back to one, one month, and we're back to the regular three, four monthly. So we cut the number of visits by half, and the patients are a lot happier. So that's a pro stop canaloplasty versus the trabeculectomy, right? And when those sutures dissolve and the patient tells you they've had glaucoma surgery and you see nothing, the only time you see something is when you do a gonioscopy and you see a little blue suture in their angle. Otherwise, you see nothing. Okay? And then, so in summary, you have to think of the progression risk score it actually seems to be related to our genetic makeup. So a very important future development for glaucoma is understanding the genetic makeup of glaucoma because other than trauma, all those other things are determined by our genetic makeup. So our aim is to cure glaucoma and not treat those people who are not at risk because we know not everybody who presents with glaucoma is at risk of going blind, but because we don't know red sore eyes um, and we have many options so we use what we feel suits the patient best so the future of glaucoma care really depends on early detection early risk stratification and as I said not all patients with glaucoma will lose sight but where do you come in 50% are still not diagnosed so the first presentation of 30% of those 50% Thank you. 
just made a difference to that one. Now, you can make a difference and I'll tell you why and how. Remember my clinic at the start of the week? Well, get what, guess what I saw Friday, yesterday morning in my clinic? A 16-year-old Somali boy who had presented with Calaisian. You would never have thought that we would routinely check pressure in 16-year-olds, but we do. We did an eye care pressure. It was 27. I did not expect that. It was just a sort of routine do right and go. I said to the assistant who did it, I bet he's got a corneal thickness of 6660. No, he had a corneal thickness of 474. No family history of glaucoma. He already had a small asymmetry, but his 0.3 disc was quite deep, even though it was 0.3. So I proceeded to do his incision and curettage, and of course I started in a protocol, and I said to him and to his parents, thinking of the first pe the two people I saw at the start of the week, you are very, very lucky to have this Calaisian. And he thought, oh, I said, and I then explained the whole thing, showed them their images, showed them the potential future, told them he has to see an ophthalmologist or an optician for the rest of the life because he probably is at high risk with such central reduced central corneal thickness. So, uh, I start to make a difference today. I think pressure and vis pressure should become as basic as visual acuity. I would say for, I kept talking about Africans, and I didn't say much about Scandinavians, but if you see pseudo-exfoliation, Scandinavians, African origin, you may not want to check it every year, but once in five years, up till the age of 40, is better than not being checked at all. So if the families stay loyal to you, and then you're careful, Origin or have a family history, and if there's absolutely no family history and nothing else there, we don't wait till 40. Once every five years, I care, non-contact. It's so easy. I mean, and that's why I did this starfish story that we can do glaucoma screening, but I think just by checking the pressure in that little boy, the the the, the moral of the story of the two men who were only, they're still actively working. One's an engineer, but he can no longer go, he works on the oil rigs. He can no longer go on site, he's, at, he's doing desk work. And he knows that his employers are only trying to stretch it out. He knows he's going to lose his job soon. And he's still actively working. And a lot of difference would have been made to his life if he had had a pressure check that much that early on. So thank you very much for listening. We provide a, a full year of care at my eye clinic. Because we know patients get anxious about you do fields, you come back, we just give them a package care. I'll take any questions.
days of patients who had laser 10, 15 years ago who now from, come from the cataract surgery. They say nothing about their laser when you're examining them. Then you see it on the split lamp. And oh, I did have something done. They've forgotten. They don't tell you. But thankfully, if we do pachymetry, then we know. But unfortunately, if we don't do pachymetry, which we can start doing routinely in everybody, we don't know. But it, I think it's now down to laser practices to say once you've had laser refractive surgery, you should see your optometrist every year to have, or at least every two years to have your pressures checked and let them know that they have to add a factor of 1.3 or something like that, or 1.2. Any other questions? Oh, thank you very much for being here early. <laughs> rushing through the doors and, and, and listening. And if you do, just send me an email. My email address is boda bravo oscar lima alpha at myeyeclinic.co.uk and I'll make sure that by tomorrow I'll send you this PDF and my um, the glaucoma uh, paper, uh, the examination and the, the treatment card. Finished. <laughs>